Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Continuing on from chapter 11. How prosperity is not the Christian's way in the earth. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell. Whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So there are three heavens, not seven. There's the dirt to as far as the ego can fly. That's as far as man can go. As far as the eagle can fly to that uh, frozen river just below God's feet. Man is not allowed there. The old man is there. That's your moon, your, your, your planets, your stars. The first heaven is, you know, the clouds, trees, birds, and all that. The third heaven is God's abode, heaven, capital H. Now Paul is saying, hey, I went there. In what way I went there, I have no idea. I can't. And you'll see this kind of thing, what well, out of body, in a body, I just don't know. People use this thing. Many think, and this is a thinking, that this is what happened when he was stoned. That he died and went to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, who this man is, we don't know. He don't know. So don't give him a name, don't give him a title, we don't know. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he caught, how he was caught up into paradise. You know, we think Paul's speaking about himself. Now paradise. Luke 16, 23, what was said about paradise? Jesus told that dying thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise still exists. Long after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's there. It's in the third heaven. It's no more in the heart of the earth. When Jesus died and rose from the grave, He took paradise and moved it to heaven. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for me for, for man to utter. You find that in the book of Revelation. So this man, Paul, whoever he gets a revelation of paradise. It's not gone. Like you know, the book Paradise Lost, it's not lost. Of such and one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmity. <clears throat> the troubles, the perils, the whipping, the abusement that we read in chapter 11. I'm not going to glory about this, this vision. So when you see somebody say, oh, I've seen this heavenly vision, or I've been to heaven, and I've been to hell. Paul says, God knows what's happened. God knows about it, but I'm going to glory on, on the suffering. How's that? That's the man that wrote, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. For though I would desire to glory, 
I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, and that he heareth me. I could tell you the truth, I could, but the truth is not relevant right now about what I'm what I'm talking about. Let's just go on with our infirmities. Let's go on with the gospel. And least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. Everything that God revealed to me, the, the seven mysteries, the gospel. Paul has had a revelation like John. They both speak to churches, seven churches. They both show us things that we never have ever seen before. And Paul could sit there and pat himself on his back and glory, look at me. I'm the chief of all the apostles because I have more than I. Paul says, no. I could tell you the truth and everything about that, how it happened. But let's just speak about the Lord. Let's speak about Christ. And because of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And it's unexplained. Some people say his eyesight. Some people say his bone. Uh, it's a thorn in the flesh. What's a thorn in the flesh? It would hurt. That's the only thing I could tell you. Now, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, if you read Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, Satan is in charge of this thorn, which God gave Paul permission, I mean, God gave Satan permission to attack Paul like he did Job. God of love. We have, a, we have another same element of pain. It may be Satan. And it may be to keep you humble. It may be to keep you praying. Because listen, if your life is wonderful, you're not going to pray. If God has put you in such a position uh, of where you can boast your life and be somebody important, God be like, Satan, uh, keep him humble for me. He wouldn't say it like that. He said, you know, attack him. And the tax would be so that you would be, you know, you can't pride. You can't boast. So here is Paul. He is a great Christian, sinner like all of us. He's a writer of the epistles to the church on how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. He has all these perils. He's been whipped. He's been prisoned. He's been near death. He's been starving. He's been this and that. And now we read a thorn in the flesh by Satan. Isn't that enough? No. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All right, you get someone saved. You witness to them the gospel through the Bible, through the word of God, they get saved. And then the next thing you know, after baptism, you would say, listen, if you're going to serve Christ, you better show them the warnings. Because they need to make a decision. Am I going to go all the way or am I going to, am I going to build that house and not have enough? Remember what Jesus said about the king? Remember you said about the man with the army? I gotta sit down and figure out how many troops I have. I gotta figure out, figure out how much money I have. Demas never fought it out. He quit. And if somebody has told you that the gospel and living as a Christian is a wonderful, spectacular, great life, you know, all kinds of blessings, they are full of it, and you call them a liar. Because then you tell them, explain to you 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and chapter 12. Explain to me Job 1 and 2. Job was a, was a great saint. And the devil came to him and said, God, I want to do this. And God could say, no, no, no. He's going to have a prosperous life. God, I want to give poor, I want to give Paul a pain, a thorn. God, no, not Paul. He's a great one. No, God said yes. That balance of blessing and thorn keeps the balance being straight. God's intention is to keep him humble. Satan's intention is to stop him. 
That's one thing we got to realize in our suffering. It may be because we may get too prideful. It may be because Satan's trying to stop us. Now, this is a thorn in the flesh that Paul had no being, nothing he did to himself that caused this flesh, this thorn. It is outside of his doing. A messenger, a messenger of Satan. Wait a minute. Let's go back over eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed. You know, Paul speaks more about Satan and nothing about hell. You know why? Because the church doesn't go to hell. Thank God. But do you know what the church has a problem with? Satan. I'm not going to hell, but I've got an enemy, Satan. So Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, he's got men in the pulpit to deceive people, to deceive Christians. He's got a messenger over here that gives you pain. That's a great messenger. Imagine open up the door, you know, back in the old days, you used to have the uh, telegram. You open up the door, yes, this is a uh, telegram company, whatever. Well, what's the message? He takes a baseball bat and smacks you across the head. That's the message. Well, that's what Satan's doing here. Here's the message. To buff it. It's to beat or hit. To destroy Paul. Amazing how we get the word buffet out of that. I've always looked at that word in buffet like... Really? Buffet me. Enough. Enough. It's enough already. At least I should be exalted above measure. You know why this is happening from God's point of view? I don't get too high on Paul. And I'm talking about Paul himself. He doesn't get prideful. He doesn't go in lofty. It's to keep him as Paul the Apostle. For this thing... What thing? The thorn in the flesh. What is it? I have no idea. I got a footnote down here. I'm not even going to read it. Because we don't know. It would have been great if, if God would have said through the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the, the ailment. But we're not told the ailment. For this thing, the, the thorn, I besought the Lord thrice that it, may, that it might depart from me. I prayed to God three times for this thing. I've asked for deliverance. God, please. It is so thorn of the flesh that Paul has to pray three times, please. Whatever it is. It's causing Paul to pray. Now watch this. Is this good news or this is bad news? Verse 9. And he, God, said unto me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. There is no healing. And yet there's an answer to pr prayer. But it's not the answer to prayer we want that whatever this thing is, it's gone. Say, God, I, I got migraine headaches and I just can't get rid of Lord God, get rid of them, please. I'll give you some relief, but not all relief. That's an answer to prayer, yes. But I'm not going to take them away. Life is not good. Whoever came up with that, that saying was stupid. Because you know how many people today are, are, are in tragedy and pain and sorrow near death and there's nothing they can do and here's Paul nothing he can do pray three times the Lord Lord said my, my grace is sufficient for thee now watch this for my for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Your infirmities makes us perfect. Uh oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not a God you can buy at the God store. 
the God store would say, what kind of God do you want? I don't want to have any cancers. I don't want to have any flus. I don't want to have any sickness. I want those juju bees, and I want that box of popcorn. Who would walk into a store and say, I want a God that's going to give me pain and sorrow for my own well-being? No one. And yet sometimes our being is for our well-being, according to God. In weakness, we are strong in God. And that violates the law of nature. Because if you're out in an African plain and you're a zebra, and you're the weakest zebra. You're the oldest zebra. You're a zebra that can't really run. You are dinner for the hungry lions. I said lion for a purpose. And yet, in our weaknesses, the lion may come and attack. And yet we still live. And we still have our being. And we can still call to God. And God is through our Father. And he's doing something in our life that is for our benefit. Because he's not going to do anything to us just for the heck of it. If I can use that word. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Okay. I'm going to use the distress of my life, whatever it is. For the honor and glory of God. That's hard. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's harder. You want God's power? You want the power of Christ? Just take your infirmities. Deal with them. Pray. You know? That's hard. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I take pleasure in infirmities. That don't sound right. But that's what worse. Doesn't Paul say, keep saying, follow me. You might also face it, whether you're saved or lost, you're going to have problems. There's going to be something there that's going to tweak you. And as in a Christian, well, pray to God and if he's not going to get if he's not going to get rid of it for you, then say, Lord, just give me relief then. Give me endurance, give me long suffering, give me peace. Because he may not heal us. And I probably just turned off a whole bunch of people. Because they don't want to hear not being healed. And I'll take any of your faith healers out there that preach. You come down here at Daytona Beach. I'll take you to the building that's right behind me. We'll go visit every floor in every room. We'll see how well your, your healing does. And then I'll pay for the gasoline. We'll go to Ronald McDonald House and St. Jude Hospital. We'll see how good your healing is. We all are not promised healing. And yet, it does happen. Glory to God. We ought to glory God more if we get healed from something. Because it's not going to stay with us. It could be worse. That cut could be worse. That broken bone doesn't have to heal. And when it does... Did you forget God? Did you pray to God about that pain? And then months down the road, oh yeah, I didn't oh, didn't have that pain. Oh, oh Lord, thank you. Paul says, therefore I take pleasure, pleasure in infirmities. Recreation. In reproaches, in necessities, you know, I've always got to have something. You always got to have something. You're never going to have your fullest. In persecutions, 
that's a good one to go through. You know, you're you're being, you know, the Bible's come live in your life. In distresses for Christ's sake. So infir infirmities, reproaches, necessities, and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. The illnesses, troubles, and problems you've got be better if they were for God and Jesus Christ. Satan knows what kind of person Paul is. So he's getting his thorn in the flesh and it's, it's for Christ's sake. Glory to God. Satan is my enemy. I've got God helping me along the way. But don't go glorying your infirmities and taking pleasures. You destroyed your whole family because you drank. That's not for Christ's sake. That's for the flesh's sake. Don't be glorifying God because you got a sexual transmitted disease. That's not for Christ's sake. That's for your shame. Don't go glorify, you know, you got the flu, you got the, this, because you went outside in the winter half naked. That's for being a fool. So what we're seeing here now is by Christ's sake, is when we suffer because we are serving Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got an enemy on our hands. And you ought to be rejoicing. The fact is that that enemy hates you enough to try to stop you. Because if, if Satan doesn't care about you, you're not living right. If Satan's got you in his eyesight, he's watching you. Then for whatever you get, it's for Christ's sake. Job was doing right. and God had a testimony of Job and Satan showed up. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's not natural. But if I'm weak because of Christ and what I'm doing for Christ, I'm, God is pleased with me. God is happy. God's going to help me. He said, well, God's going to help you. Then why didn't he take away that thorn? We've already said because so you don't get exalted. And life is not wonderful. And there is persecution. <coughs> All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But oh, when you when you got problems and you got the Lord you can rely on, the peace you get. No man with booze, cigarettes, or drugs or anything like that can get that peace that God has to give you. None. So it's a whole different thing when it's for Christ. I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me. Chapter 11. For I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind very chiefest apostles. Though I be nothing. I'm nothing. But I had to do a little glorifying and previously in this letter. To, you know, I say I spoke as a fool. And they're wondering, does he have the power? Is he really, you know? Truly the signs and apostles were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So they had the signs. But they're gone. The Corinthians did not have a full Bible. In order to witness to other people, especially Jews, they would have to use those signs because the Jews require a sign. Once the Bible is complete, once the apostles are dead, that's it. For what is it within wherein ye were inferior to other churches? Except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. Forgive me this wrong. 
I, he said over here, listen, I, I didn't charge you guys. I robbed other churches. The church in Macedonia took care of me when I was with it. I should have charged you. I should have took an offering. And Paul says, forgive me this wrong. So the work of Paul was he didn't get paid to the Corinthian church. He got paid by other churches. That violates the law. The law said if a man does you work, you're supposed to pay him that night. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. It will be the third time. And I, will, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, the money. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents. But the parents for the children. Paul is their spiritual father. He says, I'm not supposed to be laying things up for you. You're not supposed to be laying it for me. Now you go out there and birth some spiritual children and you lay up for them. Too many people today in the Laodicean church age, they're going to be charged with a fault because, oh yeah, I got all these people saved, but they didn't do nothing with them. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And he's me. Or about the collections again. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Craftiness is used in the ministry. To get the people to find out what they're really doing, what they really are, who they really are. You know, you, you didn't, your, you didn't support me. But I love you guys. I want to help you guys. But don't, don't go be boasting. Don't go be being proud or anything like that. Someone else had to help me as I helped you. You know, today... If you had a guy come in and do, let's say he, he worked he worked on your pipes in your house. Let's say you had a clog in the sink. He came and fixed that clog. And if you didn't pay him, he has all right to go to court, small claims court, and say, listen, I did this guy's job and he didn't pay me. You owe that guy money. That's Paul in the church. Well, you know, you didn't pay. Other people had to come in and pay. Did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? Did Titus take up a collection? Did Timothy take up a collection? Any other ministers? Did they take up a collection? For no. Somebody's got a problem with, with Paul and money right now. He's got a problem with the Jews. Am I, are they Hebrew? I'm even more. Are they Israelites? I'm even more. And I'm suffering. I have been given this, this thorn in the flesh by Satan. They are judging Paul. And what he's doing, he's not both. He said, listen, this is my testimony of who I am. Now, who are you? All right, you're a Hebrew, Israel, of the Jews five times received I forty uh, yeah forty stripes save one. The only Jewish people were were smitten him. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did Titus make money off you? Did Titus make a living off you? Walk we not in the same spirit, the same Holy Spirit, Titus and Paul? Walk we not in the same steps? See, Titus came. Another man came. We did not come for the money. So when people say they go to church and they get that one message about money, oh, it's all he preaches is, is money. No, that's, that's right here. That's what we're talking about right now. 
And yet there are some preachers out there, there's two things they preach about all year. Getting yourself saved and giving to the church. Getting yourself saved, getting yourself in church. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak for we speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. What we're doing, we want you to grow. We want you to be master. We want you to be Christians. That's why we do it. That's the motive of Paul and Titus's ministry. God will supply our needs somehow, some way. For I fear. And we said this before in chapter 11. At least when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. Oh. My expectation of you guys, I have a funny feeling that you're not going to live up to those. That I should be found of you such as ye would not. You, you don't want you don't want me to come and find you the way you are least there be any debates so when you get a born-again Bible believing Christian debating with other people Paul said no we're going to debate with this 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 college we're going to debate with this teacher we're going to debate with this Bible person but no No debates. Erase that. That's a sin. Envians. No envians. Well, look what he's got. Wish I had that. He never calls on me. Wrath. You know what wrath is of God to tell. No wrath. No strifes. No backbitings. No whisperings, swellings, tumults, none, anything that will separate or divide the church. Now, I'm trying to think if there's a verse in my mind right now. It won't come out right now. Oh, I'm trying to think. And least when I come again. My God will humble me among you. So be humble. Not going to be proud. <coughs> Not going to raise myself up. I'm going to be Paul the Apostle. That I should bewail many which have sinned already. And have not repented of the uncleanness. And fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed there are people in this church who are sinning and they're not confessing they're not getting right since do going and that's 2017 listen you, you got churches Bible believing born again Bible believing churches and in that congregation if God were to show you their life that week you wouldn't believe it. And in those pews, many are living lives that they're not even repenting or getting right with. What's going on in the church? Don't be fooled. And along with that, with the message from yesterday, chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, you may be in a church where Satan is in the pulpit. So we end up in Revelation 3, in the latter of the scene in church age, Jesus Christ has been totally kicked out of the church, standing outside the door, knocking on it, saying, will you come out? How's that for an imitation? Invite your friends and family out to our church, blah, blah, blah. How about the imitation of Revelation 3? Jesus says, come out of the church. You ever think about that? That's Jesus Christ saying, hey, you're in church? Really? Will you get out of that church and come to me? Because you're not in church. I'm not there. I'm out here. If I'm out here, I'm not in there. 
and Noah's Ark. God said to Noah and his family, come into the ark. So God is in the ark telling Noah, come in. He's not outside. He's not going to die with the world. And here Jesus Christ is outside the church. He's not inside. See, in Noah's ark, the righteous people were in the ark. All the world was outside. In the end of the church age, the world's in the church and Jesus Christ is outside. We flipped. And there are people in the church house that they don't care about their sins. And there are suffering Christians in the church. And they care. And they care about the people in the church. And they love the people in the church as Paul. And those that are suffering for Christ will get a reward. And there will be some of these guys, they're suffering too. Because remember when Paul said, they're probably taking the Lord's suffer. And if you don't, if you don't judge yourself, you know, you know, you could be sick. You could be, or some people could just, you know, there's some people that live perfectly healthy lives to the day they die are sinners. I don't understand it. I'm not going to get into suffering because, but all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the man that built his house upon the rock, the storm, the storms didn't stop. They still came. The wind still blew. That house stood by, you know, gutters may have came down. The, the shingles could have been blown over the place. Water could have gotten in the house. You're still going to get the storms. But the man that does not rest himself on the word of God, he gets destroyed. Someone's judging Paul. Get your life straight. Get your conduct and your life straightened with God. So when it was you do do right and that Satan shows up and gives you something in your life because you're serving. And you can turn to God and say, God, God says, I'm not going to stop it, but I'll just give you a little long suffering. I'll, I'll give you a piece about it. I'll help you. You're doing right. I'll help you. And then when we get to the latter end, like the latter end of Job. Oh, boy. And let me tell you something, one more thing about Job. And I'll tell you something about suffering. Find me in the Bible where it said Job was told what was going on behind the scenes. Show me where it says to Job exactly why all that happened. Job 42, he had no idea. So, suffering is part of the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. And if somebody tells you prosperity gospel, prosperity as a Christian, you're not a Christian living right. That's all I'm going to say.